so we'll just we'll have a we'll have a look at the at some of the footage that is actually part of the program. Um, what we're looking at is um, a propaganda film by uh, the National Socialist Movement of the Netherlands, which sympathized with the Nazis after they invaded the Netherlands in 1940. And it's showing this wonderful, um, idyllic, bucolic life, boys playing around. And uh, the, uh, the text actually, it says, the, um, the, the voiceover says that these will be the leaders of the future. Well, we all know that didn't happen, thank God. And um, so it all looks very nice. This is typical propaganda. It's actually part of the collection of the Netherlands Institute of Sound and Vision. But as I said earlier, I, I, even though I'm from the Netherlands Institute of Sound and Vision, and you probably wonder why am I presenting war collections, well, I'll tell you about this. Can we go to the slides, please? Um, we've provided a lovely old world yellow background for you just to remind you that we're sort of the only presentation from, from Europe. Um, and the, um, so what, what am I doing here for the Network War Collection is basically I'll tell you a little personal anecdote because I do love facts, but what I even love more are the sources that back up these facts. And this brings us to my first slide, which, because um, I woke up on November 10th uh, 2016, and I just couldn't believe that I had woken up in a post-truth society where facts just didn't really matter. Someone could have said something the next day, completely deny it, ignore it, deny it the next. Science had just become another opinion. It wasn't about facts. Even people coined terms like alternative facts, which in Europe, I mean, I, I'm sure this audience would agree with me, was really, I mean, we were all baffled. So that was actually the morning as well that I had to go to my EMEA conference in Pittsburgh, which I don't think I attend any of the talks because I was basically depressed in my room pretty much all the time because I had really had an existential crisis. I was wondering, what the hell am I doing in an archive? Why would I want to be an archivist? What, why would I do this? Um, because facts don't matter anymore. Sources don't matter. People just ignore them. And you can get away with it. But I snapped it, I, you know, I snapped out of it, I'm here, um, and I actually chose to become an advocate of facts and reliable sources. So what, um, so this has really been a really important driver for me to, to do what I'm doing today and to keep on doing what I'm doing today. Um, the, um, so when I was asked in 2016 to become, uh, to chair the board of an amazing program project called Network Book Collections, I immediately said yes, because basically what it does, it brings together various sources of uh, archives, collections, museums, and so on, um, to tell new stories about the Second World War. And it's not just new stories, but it's more relevant, more reliable stories, stories that are actually based on facts, on different sources that are, get, that are knotted together in a very clever way, something that Lizzie will tell you, will, will tell something more about. So as I said, Network War Collections is not what I do for a living. It's not my day job. My day job is I'm the Deputy Director of the Netherlands Institute of Sound and Vision, which is a 50-50 uh, publicly funded institution in, uh, in the Netherlands with around 300 employees. Um, what I always say that Sound and Vision is more glam than the other glams, the galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, because we are actually an archive and a museum at the same time. We have about 1.5 million hours of audiovisual assets, um, uh, ranging from public broadcasters to, um, to commercial broadcasters, amateur film, um, um, animation, documentaries, government films. But we also collect um, YouTube, social media, Dutch games, and so on, basically to reflect on the media history of the Netherlands. And what we do, we have very strict service level agreements with broadcasters, media professionals from uh, the Netherlands, with, in, in the Netherlands and abroad, um, to basically get the content out there, to deliver it to, you know, for programming, for news items, and so on. Um, and at the same time, but we also push our content to educational uh, platforms, uh, we, put it, we make it available for academic research, but also for journalists who actually still, you know, still bother to actually check facts. Um, 
So that's what we do. And as you can see, the building is quite spectacular. It's just like 30 kilometers outside Amsterdam. And we also attract about around 300,000 visitors a year that actually come to visit our museum, which basically reflects our collection. Um, as soon as early as uh, 2008, we, um, we actually decided to, um, to embrace the two-speed IT ID, which now seems a bit like obvious, but at the time it wasn't so obvious for an archive, because we realized that for an archive to, be impact, to have impact in the digital age, we needed to um, reinvent ourselves, but not move away from what an archive should do. So what we have done, we have, uh, we have a very good data infrastructure, we have 30 petabytes of material that is stored in a trustworthy digital repository uh, with the data seal of approval, um, we have an off-the-shelf MAM system to comply with all those S uh, service level agreements that we have with media professionals for uh, you know, the throughput of all the material, the ingest of all the material, and so on. That's by FIS-1, which is also used by BBC, Al Jazeera, um, uh, the media asset management system. But on top of that, and I think that's, that's really where, which is what is relevant to the network work collections, is we uh, also try to be very agile, not so much in terms of the methodology, because we're sort of agile light people, we're not, we're not, we're not too strict on that. But what we, what we mean by that is that we, we've built sort of a flexible backend, which acts as a layer between the MAM and different portals applications that we have. Because we believe that with that flexibility, that gives us enough flexibility to do more as an archive than what a, a traditional archive would actually do. And I would actually dare to argue that these things that you can do extra with that flexible backend might actually be more important than the ones that a traditional archive does. But I won't. Okay, and for the agile development, we basically use three very simple principles. Smart, connected, open. Smart basically means automate whatever you can. I mean, it's not a man versus machine thing, but machines just do it faster. Of course, there are errors, but you know, the amount of data they can actually, and that's been touched upon by some of the other speakers, the amount of material that they can actually process is enormous. It's something that we cannot compete with anymore. Connected. Don't work in isolation. Always make sure your infrastructure, whatever you develop, uh, allows you to be in touch with other organizations, other institutions, other collections as well. And even from a collection metadata point of view, try to connect to other people, collaborate, because there will always be more knowledge about your own collection outside your organization than you can actually organize within. It's a very arrogant thing of uh, museums, collection galleries, uh, archives to actually think that they have all the knowledge about their collection. That's really not true. And if there's anyone who says differently, I would love to talk to you during the lunch. Um, and then we have the third principle, which is open, which is kind of twofold. First of all, we encourage to use open, open, uh, open source software uh, in this agile development. Of course, we still have a solid foundation of the, of the, the, the MAM, but with the agile development, we actually try to use open source software wherever we can. For example, we try to be the launching customers of a lot of academic, spin, uh, academic research spin-offs that have developed, for example, new facial recognition, speech to text, uh, um, technologies. And another one is not just open source software, but also open up your collections, share vocabularies, be open. And this is exactly why we teamed up with uh, the network board collections as Sound and Vision. Because suddenly our collections were reached, uh, we, we, we reached users we reached other uh, user groups that we would never have reached. They knew things about our collection that we didn't know, and they actually did things with it that we would never have imagined. So that's a, so that's a very important thing. Um, and um, the, what you see is that for me, the two most important principles in this context of network work collections are connected and open because they're basically the foundation of linked open data. And linked open data is also the foundation of one of the most important principles of the Network for Collection program and the way we work. Um, you know, the goal of linking open data is basically to, um, to, 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 to make an extension 
um, um, to add a data commons to the, to the web by um, publishing, um, by publishing various open data sets as RDF tri uh, triples, and then, but also by setting links, RDF links, between different data items in these different data sets. So over the years, what you see here is one uh, uh, picture shows 2014, the number of the every dot is like a big data set, and then that's 2017 right next to it. So you see the, the number of RDF triples, but even a plurality of all the, the links, uh, they just are growing exponentially, and I think they will continue to do so. Um, I think opening up data and content has a wider political and economic context. Um, linked open data is, is basically a main driver for, um, for innovation, uh, for knowledge, but also um, government transparency. Um, luckily in Europe, the EU really encourages or even obliges to a certain extent um, um, public organizations that um, produce data, information, content, even audiovisual content, to publish it as open data. Um, whether it be um, weather data, statistics, research, um, geographical names, geographical information, uh, and but even cultural heritage that's been digitized by European funds or by funds or by public funds, we are obliged to actually open it up as uh, open data. Because um, I do believe that it is, um, I do believe that the, I really believe in the economy of commons or the commons economy in that when you share something, you always get a lot more back than, you know, of course there might be instances where people abuse data and open data, but I think the benefits will always outweigh the risks that you're taking. And there's, there's a couple of more facts that I wanna say about um, linked and open data is, linked data um, linking data is not possible without open data. That's something that we really, really should be very clear on because a lot of people say, oh yeah, we're doing linked open data, but their data is actually, it's not open, so you're not doing anything. You're not contributing to the, to the, whole, to the whole ID of linked open data. Uh, secondly, of course, open data doesn't, all ne doesn't necessarily mean that it's open content. For example, you can, you can, you can, you can, you can publish uh, the metadata of a documentary. It doesn't necessarily mean you can actually show the documentary or push the, the content, but copyright shouldn't be a showstopper, you know? look what you have, look at what you have and what you can actually publish and you'll see there's even bits and pieces of information of audiovisual assets that you may not be, you may not uh, be able to publish it, but you can actually uh, publish, uh, you, can, you, can, you can publish the uh, metadata as open data and that's already a huge, huge, that's already important. Why do I think that GLAMS, the galleries, libraries, archives and museums um, should lead the way um, in this whole open, linked open data um, movement is because, first of all, they already have an incredibly rich and structured data sets, which they've accumulated over the years. They're really, we're really good at that. That's what we've been doing. We actually have experience to reach out to audiences. And basically that, for example, also uh, it enables us to carry out t um, evaluations with end users. Uh, we're excellent metadata managers, um, we have a lot of knowledge on a, on a wide range of subjects, but as I said, we're not the authority always, but we do have authoritative knowledge. And let's face it, we have always been trusted repositories for government agencies, professionals, artists, I mean, whoever, even in a commercial setting, whoever creates information, knowledge, and facts has trusted us to actually keep their stuff safe. And then, there is a the principle of lots of copies keep stuff safe. So that's also the reason why I think that the, uh, that the GLAMs should really lead the way. It's also in their own interest as they have a lot of limited resources. I won't go over this, but this is just a list of linked open data initiatives and projects that the Netherlands Institute of Sound and Vision has actually worked on. And one of them that you see is the Network War Resources or the Network War Collections, uh, which is a more recent. Um, 
Um, I've actually put, I, I created a tiny URL which has a lot more information on those projects with uh, links to all the demonstrators, the tools, the applications and the papers that were published as a result of it. What these all have in, have in common is that they're very academic. And where I do think what the flaw was very often is that there wasn't a clear use case. There weren't real end users. It's like, you know, obsessed by your customers. That's really what you should be. And I think that's why the network war collections as a project has actually a lot more longevity than its academic predecessors. Because um, what they do have in common, these projects, is that they collaborate, whether they want it or not. You know, whether, whether they want to or not. But collaboration is really a key issue. Collaboration and openness are really the main drivers of the success of the Open Data Initiative. Um, and the use case that was missing in the more academic uh, linked open data projects is really something that's super important in network work collections. Because we brought together um, an amazing group of museums, uh, um, museums, uh, collections, archives um, that have as a main core, as a main mission to keep the, the memory of the World War alive. As you all know, um, the last eyewitnesses are dying. So basically, how are we going to um, keep the memory alive just to make sure that history won't repeat itself? that people just won't fiddle around with history and just make up a whole different story. And I think what we've done with Network Work Collection is really get that group of people together who are actually convinced that this is what we should be doing and um, that what we, what we really achieve is that we want to use all these sources, all this information that we have, bring it together and tell maybe a new, not a new story, but a more reliable story and gain new insights in what, all, what, what happened to victims, to aggressors, to events in the Second World War. So where are we at now? We started in 2016, and so far we already have more than 86 different um, museums, institutions, and so on, who have uh, published their, uh, um, their, their, their collections as open data uh, to this project, um, which is quite a thing, because to a lot of them it was very it was quite a, a threat because you know being o opening up your collection means you're opening up your biggest asset what was going to happen and actually they've all come back to us saying that they were super enthusiastic because now they know more about their collections than they ever knew their metadata has been enriched and so basically how we do that is something that the data evangelist that's how i call her lizzie Yongma of the project um works she will explain how we all go about and where we are standing Thank you, Tom. Um, I would like to start with uh, quoting Mark Twain, who said that history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And that is um, what is important for us. Um, we don't expect a new world war, but there are definitely lessons uh, from the past that we can learn nowadays. Um, but how? do we try and educate people about the Second World War? Well, this is a, a website, and you can say this is just an interface, and it is, it's a Dutch interface, so I try to use Google Translate to translate it, but, you know, it can still look a bit disappointing. You know, where is the big linked open data system that I expected you to show me today? Um, well, even though um, we currently have 11 million objects in our collection, uh, and it's 226 collections, uh, and we even have 1,300 films. Uh, we tried not to be the linked open data thing that most people expect. Um, this is uh, what I call uh, the sparkle endpoint tyranny. Uh, we work a lot with people from universities, researchers, and they are all linked open data evangelists. And then they collect all this data, and then you ask them, well, show me your data, and this is what you get as far as point. And I was so happy to hear 
a lot of, a lot of talks this morning about your users. Um, I'm a trained historian uh, and I know my colleagues and none of them is able to get anything out of this. So what's linked to open data if you can put it into a system but no one is able to get it out of that system because it, the interface is super complex. Um, well, it even takes me a lot of time to get data out of the usual linked open data systems. So let me go back, go back to this picture. Everything is linked to open data except for the interface. I'm totally trying to avoid difficult interfaces. I'm trying to use the ideas of linked open data in a completely different way. Um, so what, does, what makes us different as a network for war collections? What makes us different from other GLAM institutes? Um, first thing, we don't own physical collections. And we don't. People keep on offering us physical collection because they've seen our portal site and they keep on calling me, you know, I have stuff from my grandparents. Do you want it? No, bring it to a museum, bring it to an archive. Once it's digitized, I want to have it, not the physical object. Uh, so we're only working with digital information, no, digi no real object. Uh, but what we do is we help um, on, in red, the content department. We help GLAM digitize the collections. A lot of the organizations we work with, uh, they have four people on staff. One is both the IT person, the morning manager, and the volunteer guide, and he's also the person who, need, who needs to do all the digitization. So a lot of organizations we work with, very small organizations, little knowledge about IT, we try and help them digitize their collections. And we also try to help them publish their digital collections online. Plus we advise them about all the rights and legal aspects of their data and their digital objects. Because one of the big mistakes, and I guess you all know this, uh, one of the big mistakes people make is that they think that if the object that they digitize is copyrighted, that the metadata is copyrighted as well. So we get weird debates about copyright claims or metadata, uh, which is not true. As an institute, when you create metadata, your metadata is, is either within your copyright or it's copyright free in the Netherlands. So, you know, skip the debate. Um, that's one thing we do. So we help create our own collections. So we have a very personal interest in it. We need the digital collection. So we're interested in organizations digitizing it. But we're also creating reference data. Um, the who, the what, the where, and the when. And this is my next slide. Um, what we try and do is not just ingest everything about the Second World War. We also try and explain something about the Second World War. If you put 11 million objects in a database and you put a Google box in your, in your interface, then you're not helping people. You really aren't. It's like, um, well, Google itself, you Google for something and you get 100,000 hits. And Google is good in estimating what is relevant for you, or goodish. Um, <laughs> well, as a historian, I know that it doesn't always understand what I'm looking for. Um, but we're not as good as Google. We don't have the kind of big data that Google has to make these kinds of assumptions about a user. So uh, we don't have reference data to you know, make all kinds of automated uh, guesses. Uh, we need reference data to create our own estimations. Um, so this is what we do. These are the four historical questions every historian asks. And we created, um, you, you used the word lexicons this morning. We call them thesauri. We created thesauri for these four axes. And um, no, it's, uh, it's not this slide. I'll get back to the thesauri. I will show them what they look like. Um, but this is what we create. And the network only has four people on staff, four and a half. Um, so this is all the time we can invest in creating something that is understandable for huge audiences. So what we do is this is in our kitchen. This is what we do in the back end. So most organizations send us their data, their metadata, in one form or the other. Uh, thank God a lot of uh, vendors now have APIs, so we can harvest AV APIs. Um, 
But a lot of times people just send us uh, Excel sheets. Uh, I even got USB sticks by mail with handwritten notes to it. This is my collection, can you use it? So uh, one of the basic principles of linked open data, of course, is that an or uh, an or collection owning organization publishes its data as linked open data on the internet and I'm able to connect to it and you know, voila, it all works. Uh, but the reality is that most museums don't have triples, don't have API, don't have anything except for Excel. So a lot of times we convert metadata in any form uh, to XSLT and we create triples for organizations. This is not something museums are currently doing. We're doing it for them. And it's, it's not very difficult when you know what you're doing. Um, we use very simple ontologies. We use Dublin Core, we use schema.org. I've seen tons of theoretical ontologies created by every research group in any university in the world. Uh, so I always check like who's maintaining this ontology and has it been updated since 2002. Um, so <laughs> and then you end up with Dublin Core and schema.org. That's the reality. <laughs> um, so you could, I'm, I'm doing this on a notepad and it, it works brilliantly. Um, the output of the conversion first goes into our system. Um, this is a screenshot and we use a system that is very visual, thank God. Uh, but as you can see, it's not very, it's not very linked. It's just uh, a screenshot of a lot of collections, different collections just sitting there being a collection. There's no interaction yet. Uh, although at this point, I can already send triples back to the museum or the organization that gave me their data. So we can send them RDF files or NTurtle files or whatever they want. So they can then use it within their own uh, system as triples. Unfortunately, most museums are clueless what to do with the files I send them. Uh, so <laughs> I still need to find a better way of sharing our data with them so they can actually use it and not you know, start out crying in tears when they see what I send them. Um, but again, this is just you know, all different collections in a system standing there. What we then do is we use our thesauri. So these are the, this is a screenshot of one of the thesauri I talked about. Um, we have a couple of them. This is the uh, what is this thesaurus. It's about object names, uh, object uh, types, but it's also about historical events during the Second World War. And it's also about uh, places like concentration camps. Uh, currently we have over 5,000 keywords in our thesaurus. So ranging from object names to, um, I, think, I don't see, can you see? 431 European concentration camps. We also have 160, 170 camps in Asia in the system. Um, but we also have a, a thesaurus for a notable people during the Second World War consisting of over 1,100 names. Uh, and we har harvested Wikidata, the geo uh, section of it to uh, detect places in the objects that we get. So, how do we use this? Um, well, first thing is, we can plot camps, for instance, on maps. <coughs> this was the first thing that we built, simply based on our camps thesaurus. Uh, we plotted a map with all the concentration camps in the Netherlands. Uh, the cool thing was that immediately, People from Wikidata started contacting us and asking us, can you give us your data about camps? Uh, we're lacking half of them. I, we don't even know where you got them from. Um, and this is one of the things we did together with Wikidata, and this is one of the collaborations I'm really proud about, is we, were ver we very easily were able to share all the data about the concentration camps we have with them. They matched it with the concentration camps that were already in Wikidata, uh, and they gave us their Q codes. The Q codes are the Wikidata identifiers. They gave them back to us so we can now reuse them. And we know when we talk about the same camps or when we found a camp that they don't know about. And on the other hand, uh, when you publish your camps on Wikidata, uh, you can see that people are using them. Some of the camps did not have a description on Wikipedia yet. So most of the camps now have a description because someone picks it up and starts editing and starts adding information. 
Uh, so the outreach on our website is really nice, but the outreach on Wikidata and Wikipedia is mind-blowing. Um, so that's one of the nice things of open data is that if you have it and you share it, someone else can do really cool stuff with it. Um, but as I was saying, our collections were just sitting in our system all by themselves, all by myself, um, <laughs> doing nothing. <laughs> so you want to do something extra with them to make them link, to make something completely different. Because a collection, it, you know, if you just publish it in your portal site, it's the same as the collection on someone's website, but then with a lot more objects standing next to it doing nothing. Um, so this is a uh, software that we use. It's built in the Netherlands. And it's, for me, this is when, you know, Elasticsearch, nice, but this is really cool stuff. Uh, what it does, it splits searching up in building blocks. It's like playing with Lego as a search engine. Um, <laughs> so what I can do is I can get a collection and I can extract all the different parts from a collection. I can extract classes, I can extract text, I can extract date from it, and I can start matching stuff. Uh, so in this case, I match uh, uh, one um, collection, the image bank of the city of Nijmegen, and I can compare it to the, the WO2 thesaurus, but I can also match it to biographies from the Second World War. And what I can do is I can look for in the collection, I can look for descriptions, I can look for subjects, I can look for titles, I can look for dates, and then I can start comparing it with other collections. And every comparison leads to a new set and leads to connections. For instance, I have a keyword in Nijmegen which matches to a keyword in my biographies database, and I can say, okay, this is the same as that. And the nice thing is that you can also use it to compare less ob obvious things. Uh, one example I always use is that in the Netherlands, we started using the word bunker after the Second World War to honor the, the Americans for liberating that. Before the Second World War, we had a different word for bunkers, a, a typical Dutch word. Uh, we can use it as alternative terms, and we can make comparisons, and still if someone uses the Dutch word or if someone uses bunker, if someone uses plural or singular, we can all match it and it all ends up with the same keyword. So this is one way to connect all these collections. And then we give up the notion of collections. So our second step in processing data is we still mention with each object what collection it comes from, but it's not very relevant in our context. It's relevant for the organization that contributes the data, but when you publish a portal about the Second World War, it's only of secondary relevance where the data comes from. Our audiences are interested in photographs, they're interested in films, they're interested in the Battle of Arnhem, they're interested in D-Day. They're not interested in the city hall um, archives of the city of Nijmegen. Uh, and I remember that this was a big shock in the beginning. Every organization I worked for was always, you need to put everything about the organization on your home page. People want to know what departments you have. They don't give a fly. And um, so, you know, <laughs> no, really, <laughs> you know, I worked in the arts and crafts of the 19th century department. Most people can't even spell that properly, let alone search for it on your website. So give up. Um, so this is what we do. We try and figure out what people are interested in and then try to cluster all the objects that we have around their interests. And then, this is what we do with it. And we're going to redesign the website using users because this was only the first iteration. Now people are actually using it so we can still we can see where the flaws are. Uh, but one of the cool things that we do is, uh, you can see the red uh, tags here. This is all machine done. So this is what the output of all the process that we went through. Um, this specific object from an um, um, image bank in Zaanstad uh, describes the liberation of this town. Uh, but they, they did describe a lot about this town, but they forgot to add keywords. Um, so, you know, when you look at it, there's n in the beginning there's nothing to hang on to, to use this collection. Uh, but when we started using uh, uh, our systems, we could add keywords to their uh, objects. Um, and we can also make the distinction between places and people and other keywords, and we can share it back to them. 
but also it makes it a lot easier to find this object. And if you find this object, you can click on these keywords and find relevant objects from other archives, like books that are not from the same city or monuments about the same event. Um, so we created a, a thesaurus and it's also our own encyclopedia. So for instance, if you search for the concentration camp Mauthausen, a really awful concentration camp, uh, we, we don't just present documentation about it. Uh, we also write very small articles, a um, bit like the Wikipedia header about these camps where we get it from Wikipedia. And we also add keywords, relevant keywords for this camp. So you can, if you don't know much about the concentration camp, uh, if, you go to, uh, if you get this passage, you can still click and find all kinds of different information about this specific concentration camp. Uh, you even get people that were incarcerated in this camp, uh, and you can find a, a mark on the map where this camp was located. Um, so this, again, we're going to redesign the website this year to even make it a more of a user experience to help them uh, search and research the Second World War, even if you don't know much about it. Uh, but we're all, we are also doing a different project called uh, War Lives, and that was because one of the things we found out in our statistical uh, data from our website was that most people that ser are searching our collection they're not searching for the Battle of Arnhem or D-Day, they're searching for their grandfather, uh, their ancestors, their nephews, uh, maybe people they knew from the Second World War. Um, and we didn't have much information about people in our collection. Actually, most archives uh, have information about people like death registries, marriage registries, birth registries, but it's, they have it in separate systems, usually for people doing ancestry research, um, but they don't really use it for historical uh, presentations. So that's one of the reasons why we didn't have much information about people. And we started actively collecting information about people, and we use linked open data to reconstruct life. Um, for me, it's very logical, but I know a lot of people are surprised what we're doing with people's lives. Um, so this is a screenshot. We're gonna publicly launch this website by the end of this year. And uh, we could launch it now, but unfortunately Europe has very strict privacy laws. Uh, so we have to uh, prove that everyone that we publish about is dead. Um, well, I can tell you they are, but you know, proving it in a legal way is still a difficult process. So we're in the middle of the process getting it cleared so we can publish it. Um, so, what's next level about uh, reconstructing people's lives? Well, first of all, because most archives aren't very structured in uh, annotating people's lives or annotating people, uh, we had to find many different resources about people that participated in the Second World War. So it's not just archival documentation, we also had to crawl a lot of websites, mainly commemorative websites. Uh, in the Netherlands, there's the Jewish monuments about all the Jewish victims of the Second World War. Um, but there's also, you have also have local websites like this one. It is about uh, the people that were uh, picked up by the Germans during a razzia and were all deported to Germany. Um, a lot of archives have, met, have um, archival material that isn't digitized yet. So we either crawl websites or we help organizations digitize uh, this kind of material. Um, we do anything to get this data. And again, we convert people's names to linked open data. Again, same tools, XSLT, uh, Notepad. Um, but what was interesting was that we couldn't use Dublin Core to <laughs> describe people, so we had to make up our own metadata schema. Uh, or actually, I didn't want to create my own ont ontology. I wanted to use existing ontologies to create information about people. Um, so what we use is a lot of schema.org and only occasionally do we create our own namespaces if there's nothing in schema.org that I can use. Uh, but what I learned um, was that it, you can best split a person's name, uh, create a sort of metadata about a person, name, place of birth, uh, place of death, 
date of death, uh, date of birth. That's the metadata about a person. And in all these resources, you can find information about people in a specific event. Uh, for instance, the transportation archives of the Jews being deported to Germany. There's a lot of archival material about it. Um, so if you create a transportation event, then you can try and match names of a person in the transportation archives to a name of a person in another archive, for instance, a birth or a death archive. Um, it took us a while to get this right, uh, but it's really cool. And this is unfortunately very light. I'm very sorry. Um, but this is where the building blocks that we use are really cool because this is where we can use all the search algorithms that you, know, you have at your service. So we use everything, both the Jairo Winkler and Levenstein, and you weigh and you match, uh, because in most archives, uh, people's names are misspelled by one or two letters, uh, so you can weigh that. Uh, dates of birth, usually you have a date of birth, but sometimes they were misspelled as well, or people lied about their date of birth, for instance, because they didn't want to be deported. Uh, so you need to take all these variables into account and do a lot of calculations <laughs> and then you can match names of people from more generic resources to very specific archives about specific events. And this is what we now have. So we have entered 1.2 million events, uh, and birth and death are events as well. And we were able to reconstruct the lives of 230,000 people. Uh, so for me, there's a big difference between a name and a person. A name is something, for instance, the writer of a book, you have a name, but you know nothing about this person until you start accumulating data about this person. And that's what we're doing here. Out of all these events, we try and compose, recompose a person's life. Um, and this is what a person's life can look like in our own portal site. So we try and explain as much as possible on a timeline about this person, so it's a bit like the horrible version of Facebook, where you have a timeline of a person's life. Uh, this person was transported a lot of times to many different awful concentration camps. And because we collect concentration camps, we were even able to plot his uh, personal route on a map, as you can see here. And the thing is, we, we were perfectly happy about it, and we showed it to people that you know, were Googling for names of family members. And they are in shock because a lot of people don't really know what happened to their relatives. They know that they're dead, but most people don't know how much happened to their ancestors during the war. And that is one thing that we try and visualize is what could happen in a war. Um, and of course, you know, you start doing big data stuff. We, we don't publicly do this because, you know, this will give us a lot of de debate. Um, but we plotted the deadliest dates and the deadliest places for Dutch people during the Second World War on a map and a timeline. And I won't go into it that much, but um, this was very easy to do. Uh, and it also shows that there's a big misconception in the Netherlands, and that was, for instance, that the beginning of the war, 1940, was a very deadly period, which is not true. And another uh, assumption most people have is that during liberation and the hunger winter in 1945, a lot of people died, whereas actually most people in the Netherlands during the Second World War died in 1943. So this is all the, the powerful things you can do with these kinds of, with this data. Um, and we're still exploring it. Um, but where do you draw the line? Um, I showed this picture to Tom and uh, Eve was looking at me and saying, okay, that's a nice picture. What is your story here? Uh, well, as you can see, the first person was a young boy who died before he reached the age of 10. Uh, the second guy is a very sad story. His brother was the uh, so National Socialist Movement leader of the Netherlands, and he was executed because his brother was the leader of the National Socialist Movement. Uh, Third person also died very young, but the last, but he died uh, in Russia. So he joined the SS and started fighting at the Eastern Frontier. 
Um, we, we still have a lot of debates. Do we mention these people in our War Lives website? Or is it a commemoration site where we honor the victim? Last person is even more interesting. Katja Schott was a camp commander and she was awful. She killed 10 women because she had a bad evening. Um, she was convicted after the Second World War, but she's, she's still alive. Uh, her image is published on many different websites because there, there are images, but usually they don't explain who she is. So you just find her image. Do we take her into our system and where do we draw the line? Um, I, I think we should include everyone in our portal site, uh, but I'm very much aware that with the last person, um, we will also create some sort of new witch hunt for her. I know she's already mentioned on the website uh, looking for Nazis in the Netherlands. Um, so, um, as Tom started his talk, uh, we are trying to fight tyranny by showing it. Uh, so we're trying to show what it looked like uh, during and before the Second World War in Europe. And we hope people can use all the data that we have about the Second World War to study the Second World War and to interpret things that are happening in our days. Um, and we publish it on our own website and we hope that for people we are trusted because we collected trusted resources, but we also share everything that we collect with everyone else. Uh, one of the projects we did with Sound and Vision was that we researched uh, their collection and we found um, Nazi propaganda movies that were out of copyright. And we published them uh, in collaboration with Sound and Vision again, on Wikimedia Commons. So everyone can, can watch them, can um, use them to, enter to, to write articles on Wikipedia or and can use them for whatever. Um, but just showing these images, uh, we think is helpful to understand both Second World War and our current time. Um, so I would like to end with this last movie. And this one is really important and for me really important to share because this is the only film footage about the Shoah. This is an actual concentration camp. This was filmed by the, uh, a, a filmmaker in concentration camp Westerbork. And this is the only proof that people were really deported to concentration camps. So could you please show this movie? And as you can see, uh, Germans were administrating everything. And we're a bit thankful because we can use these administrations to reconstruct life.
couple minutes over, but I'd like to entertain a couple of questions about that extremely powerful presentation. Thank you, Lizzie and Tom. I have an immediate question. I think about things about the fact that you know, the current American administration, with some of the agencies in its service, kidnapped thousands of children from their parents, and we now know that that number was actually much higher than was reported a year or two ago. Um, there are thousands of children who are still disconnected from their parents. And I think about utilizing both the kind of schemas and, and technologies that you guys put into work here for an historic event. Have you done any work with activist organizations to encourage them to utilize these types of technologies much closer to the occurrence of events so there's a richer history both immediately accessible to us as we do research as to what actually occurred and how it affected even individuals? Um, because it seems like a very, very powerful set of approaches and technologies to, to bring to solving more immediate issues. Uh, no, we haven't. I hadn't even thought of it. I think that would be a very good uh, application. We do work with a lot of historians because the problem that we ran into when you have a reference to a name in an archive and you wonder, is this the same person that is referenced in another archive? Uh, most historians deal with this problem. So we work a lot with historians um, and they all recognize this, uh, this issue and um, next month I'm going to do another workshop with a lot of historians. Uh, but we're looking into the golden age uh, or uh, you know, 18th century archival documentation. But I think current, in, uh, current situations could be a, another very good application. Yeah, I'll mention we had uh, Yvonne Eng from the Witness uh, Foundation speak last year, and they do a lot of work on tracking media for contemporary events and human rights abuses. And I'd say Witness would be a fantastic organization for you guys to consider working with, um, because you know they're, they're studying a lot of these types of contemporary events that are captured in rich media, and I think these approaches would be very powerful yeah. in helping them in their mission.